1991, a normal year for tornadoes in the U.S., when you look at the numbers, with 1,115 tornadoes being confirmed. However, one very notable outbreak would manifest on the 26th through the 27th of April 1991, spawning 62 tornadoes, killing 21 and injuring hundreds. As many F2 plus tornadoes would impact primarily Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska, including four F4s and one F5 that would cover path through the Wichita metro and Andover, killing 17. This outbreak would create new discoveries and dangerous myths. In this video, we break down the meteorological setup, the outbreak, and its aftermath. 1991 had a slower start to the tornado season, with 198 tornadoes touching down in the three months leading up to April. Majority touching down in March, with 158 tornadoes coming from a series of outbreaks. Through the first 25 days of April, 105 tornadoes had touched down, bringing the tally for the year up to 303. That number was soon to go way up. On April 25, 1991, the National Weather Service issued a warning of impending weather system, noting that the computer models were, quote, indicating this to be a very significant severe weather producer, with tornadoes occurring across the central slash southern plains. On the morning of April 26, a high risk of severe weather was issued across the Great Plains. A southeast tilted trough existed across the southwestern United States that morning. Winds at the 500 millibar were around 60 to 70 knots in most places, and lower at the 850 millibar, a powerful low-level jet was streaking across the central plains. This created winds in excess of 50 knots for most of the central plains region, and in the area the Andover F5 would touch down, winds were around 60 knots. Temperatures in the 70s and dews in the mid-60s created cave values of 4,000 joules per kilogram. Tornado-producing storms first developed across western Oklahoma around sunrise. These storms weakened as they moved northeast into Kansas. Back to the west, the dry line progressed rapidly eastward, but began to slow during the afternoon hours. Attempts at thunderstorm development along this feature initially failed. At 12.20 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for the potential for multiple strong to violent tornadoes. This would be one of the 24 convective watches issued during the day. Despite early failure at convective initiation, supercell thunderstorms rapidly erupted along the dry line during the early afternoon hours as all the ingredients were coming together. The outbreak is underway. The first few tornadoes of the day touched down in Kansas and Oklahoma, with several F2s. One of these tornadoes would destroy a large building at a nurse-slash-greenhouse complex. The first significant tornado of the day touched down in Kansas before moving into Nebraska, where the town of Lanham sustained considerable damage. Farms sustained heavy damage near Odell, and several homes were destroyed south of Batrice before the tornado dissipated. This tornado would be rated F3. Several more F1s and 2s would touch down before another F3 would touch down in Nebraska. Four farms were destroyed and three others were severely damaged. Thirteen houses were also damaged. Two people were injured. And around this time in Kansas, at 5.49 p.m. Central Daylight Time, a tornado would touch down east of Clearwater. The tornado this day is known for has just begun. At 6.05 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the National Weather Service issued a statement urging residents in Hayesville, Thurby, and Mulvane to seek shelter as the tornado tracked northeast. Around 6.16 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the intensifying tornado began to affect southeastern sections of Wichita and directly struck Hayesville. It produced strong F2 to F3 damage in Hayesville while growing to the width of about 220 yards, acquiring multi-vortex characteristics. The tornado then crossed the Kansas Turnpike about, about a half mile south of the South Wichita Interchange. In eastern Wichita, some well-built homes in the Greenwich Heights subdivision were completely leveled, indicative of strong F3 to F4 damage. Four people were killed at this location. At 6.24 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the tornado struck the McConnell Air Force Base, where it narrowly missed a lineup of 10 B-1B bombers, each worth $280 million and two of which were equipped with nuclear warheads. Nine major facilities on the base were destroyed, including the officers' club, base hospital, library, elementary school. In addition, 102 housing units were demolished. No fatalities were recorded there, though 16 people were injured, and total losses reached $62 million. 
as the tornado continued to move toward U.S. Row 54 in Kansas in the direction of Andover. It prompted forecasters to issue a heightened tornado warning, alerting residents in Augusta and Andover that a damaging tornado was approaching. Despite this warning, the tornado sirens in Andover failed. At 6.31 p.m. Central Daylight Time, with the sirens having failed, the Andover police drove through the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park warning, urging residents to seek shelter. Shortly after, 10 minutes later, the large tornado entered southern Andover and began to impact the Mobile Home Park, which ultimately sustained a direct hit. Of the 244 manufactured homes, 205, or about 84% of them, were destroyed. Post-storm interviews by health officials found that 339 residents were home during the tornado, of which 146 evacuated, 149 sought refuge in the community shelter, and 38 remained in their homes. No casualties, thankfully, occurred among the individuals who fled or utilized the shelter. However, 13 people were killed, another 17 were hospitalized, and 9 sustained minor injuries among the group who remained in their structures. Additional homes were swept from their foundation to the west of this park, where the Andover tornado earned its F5 rating. Throughout the city, over 1,500 residencies were devastated. The tornado continued northeast, affecting the outskirts of Tawanda. Twenty minutes later, the violent tornado dissipated west of El Dorado and north of the Kansas Turnpike. The tornado was over, but the outbreak was certainly not. Shortly after the Andover tornado had touched down, an F3 destroyed two homes and a pickup truck was rolled 150 yards and demolished. 30 minutes later, an F4 touched down in Oklahoma and would track 66 miles with a max width of over 1,500 yards. The tornado began 2.5 miles east of Garber and continued south of Billings. In this area, it reached F3 intensity, snapping power poles, toppling well pumps, demolishing a house, and destroying oil tanks. As it neared Interstate 35 and crossed in Noble County, the tornado first reached F4 intensity, flattening a house and debarking many trees. In neighboring Osage County, two farms were destroyed before the tornado continued into Osage County. There it passed west of Pawhuska, toppling an oil rig with an 18-inch foundation. It lifted west-northwest of that city. Along the tornado's path, across sparsely populated areas, several county roads had portions of their asphalt stripped away. A University of Oklahoma chase team headed by Howard Bluestein utilized mobile Doppler weather radar to analyze the tornado. The radar measured peak winds of 270 to 280 miles per hour at the top of the tornado's funnel, suggesting that this tornado probably had F5 winds close to the ground. At the time, this represented the strongest winds ever measured by radar, including the first measurements of F5 intensity winds. While the before-mentioned tornado touched down, another F4 in Kansas would go on to level home south of Hackney. A woman was killed near Tisdale when it destroyed her manufactured home, despite advance warning that a tornado was approaching. Many F2s and F3s would touch down before another F4 began near Turleton, Oklahoma, inflicting minor to moderate damage to trees, power poles, and a few structures. The tornado rapidly intensified, sweeping several cars off the Cimarron Turnpike, resulting in a fatality and five injuries. The tornado then struck the Keystone Air Park, destroying four hangars and seven airplanes. Two of the planes were tossed into trees. The fire station at the airport was destroyed, with one fire engine tossed a quarter of a mile into trees across the runway. The tornado struck Westport, destroying 54 homes, 70 vehicles, and 5 manufacturer homes, 18 outbuildings, and 3 travel trailers. Another 40 homes in addition to the Westport Community Center were also damaged. The tornado then snapped numerous trees and destroyed a Girl Scouts lodge near Lake Keystone before causing additional severe damage in the Skiatook area where 32 homes were destroyed, and 56 others were damaged. Several boats and a marina were damaged at Skiatook Lake. In total, 24 people were injured. Many more F2s and 3s would touch down before another F4 would touch down in Oklahoma. Though short-lived, this large and violent tornado devastated the town of Ugala before abruptly dissipating with 60 homes, 16 trailers, 30 barns, and 16 apartment buildings destroyed. The Ugla school building was severely damaged. Several metal high-tension towers were downed, and 22 people were injured. 
On top of the destruction this tornado caused, a downburst that followed the storm caused further damage. One F2 on this day that didn't really do much on paper has gained a reputation for many people pointing to it as starting the underpass and tornado myth. The tornado gained notoriety when a Kansas television crew sought shelter underneath an overpass on the Kansas Turnpike. Video from the crew shows a minivan several hundred yards down the turnpike being rolled multiple times, with other vehicles such as a large semi-trailer trucks overturned and severely damaged as well. Alongside the 1979 Wichita Falls at 4 Tornado, this marked the second prominent example of people seeking refuge from a tornado beneath an overpass. Information from the National Weather Service initially and indirectly contributed to this line of thought as well. However, this terrible practice was exposed during the May 3, 1999 tornado outbreak. During KFOR's broadcast, legendary meteorologist Mike Morgan told people on the roads to find an underpass and get under the girders of it. Unfortunately, people who did seek shelter under them busted the myth in the worst way possible. Three people under overpasses were killed on May 3rd. Many others sustained horrifying injuries such as broken bones, missing fingers, noses, and ears. In the wake of the tornado outbreak, Kansas Governor Jean Finney requested that President George H.W. Bush supply Sedgwick, Butler, and Cowley counties with federal disaster aid, a move that the president later approved. 31 years later, in 2022, another tornado would impact Andover, this time being rated EF3, with some of the most stunning tornado footage there is on YouTube and online as a whole. To conclude, this outbreak was extremely notable with new scientific discoveries, but on the other hand, this outbreak caused major damage, primarily in Oklahoma and Kansas, and it also started one of the deadliest tornado myths ever. If you enjoyed, consider liking and subscribing, as these videos always take a long time to make, so that would be much appreciated. Also, I have a Discord, so if you want to keep up to date with my channel and get more behind the scenes and stuff and talk about weather and whatnot, then I suggest you join. And, uh, yeah, that's all. Have a nice rest of your day, and goodbye.